Let us pray briefly as we speak on the topic today, what God wants. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity. We thank you that you're in this space and living within us. We thank you that you desire to give us a word um, to speak to us, to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would make it clear, that you would convict, comfort, and connect with each person here today. Lord, we're grateful that you have given all so that we could live for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey man, how many of you guys are familiar with the term wingman? Wingman. Do you know do you know what that means? What it means to be a wingman or wing woman? Right? We believe in equality here. Wing women as well. What it means to be a wingman. So for those of you who may not know, being a wingman essentially is this position that you accept as someone's friend. If they come and they talk to you and they say, listen, Jamil, I'm really interested in this girl and I don't know how to start a conversation. Can you help me out? Like, can you be my wingman? That is, that is, that is what it means to be a wingman, right? So then I, I have the choice to accept or reject, or reject that request, right? And in doing so, It stops being about me because my main goal is to make the other person look good. Whenever I talk to that person, you know, I talk to that person of interest, I cannot make myself look better than my friend because the main goal is to make my friend look good. That is why they asked me. I cannot make it about myself. The main goal is saying, listen, if you think I'm strong, you should see my friend, right? He's a monster, right? Like, I'm I'm hyping him up as much as I can. I remember having a friend in college where he asked me to do something. Now, this one was a specific wingman task um, and mission because most times when you're a wingman, you're pretty much just complimenting your friend and just making them look good. But on this one, I kind of had to prepare the way for him to do what he needed to do, right? And let me explain. Because there was a girl that liked him that he did not like, right? But she was going to the same social gathering as the girl that he did like. But he needed me to clear the way because there were a lot of things in the way of him actually being able to get to know the girl that he did like. So my mission was to take attention away from him for that girl so that he would have, he wouldn't have anything in the way, right? He could just walk clearly. And as an introvert, that was very hard because I did not care to be friends with this girl. I, I had zero desire. But I knew that I really valued my friend and I knew he really wanted to have that extra freedom and space that he needed to get to know this other girl. So that day I worked overtime (laughs) in my wingman title. At the end of the night, I had a handshake with this girl. We had inside jokes and I was exhausted, right? (laughs) Absolutely exhausted. But because of that, right, because of, because of putting myself in a lower position, making myself second, my friend was able to do what he needed to do to get to know that girl, right? But the main goal, again, is not myself, but making that person look good. There is a wing man that we're going to talk about in the Bible. His name was John the Baptist. And his job was to prepare the way, to make sure that there were no obstacles in the way of what Jesus was going to do during his mission here on this earth. And he accepted that mission with his whole heart. As we discuss John the Baptist today, I want you to think about how can we as individuals accept that same role? right? To be second, to make sure that in every interaction we have with other people, they don't leave saying, 
Man, Jamil is such a good guy. Man, Vanessa is so cool. But they leave thinking about God and giving the glory to God because that is what we are here to do. And if you're curious, that friend that he helped out is married to a girl. Not that girl, but a girl. So we're grateful for all the hard work that you did for him. As we look at the story of John, we're going to be, you can find the story of John in multiple Gospels, but we're going to really park in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. So turn or scroll to your Bibles, Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. As we look at the life of John the baptizer, uh, really what he did became his name, the one who would go and make a call for repentance, for God to come into the lives of those whom he was preaching to. He is a great example for us for what God wants to do in our life. Now, God does many things, and so today is not going to be an end-all, but there are at least three things that we can see in the life of John that God did that he also wants to do in our life. And the first is found in Luke chapter 3, verse 2. Luke chapter 3, verse 2, and my Bible says as so. During the high priesthood, or the reign of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the, what does your Bible say there? In the, in the wilderness. This is so beautiful to me. Because it wasn't in a prime place. It wasn't in the busyness. It wasn't even to those high. I love how the Bible has this contrast. You have, you have Annas and Caiaphas, right? They are the high priests. They're top of the top when it comes to position, when it comes to influence. And yet the word of the Lord is revealed to John in the wilderness. Now this word wilderness is eremos. Can you guys say that? Eremos. Eremos. And it can mean several things. It can mean wilderness. It can mean quiet place. It can be, mean to be set apart. But what I love about the life of John is, is that it reminds us that what God wants to do is to reveal himself to us. He wants to reveal his character, who he is, what he thinks about us. He wants to reveal his will and his purpose to us. And where he often does that is in the wilderness. And the wilderness can tend to have a negative connotation. Like you ever talk to someone and they just seem a little heavy and you're like, brother, how you doing? I'm in the wilderness, my friend. I'm just struggling out here with the desert. I'm in the wilderness. But the promised land is coming. You see, the wilderness tends to be this negative space or it's a, uh, it has a negative connotation. It's a place of weakness where things are stripped away. But I would argue, and a book I'm reading also argues the same thing, that wilderness is actually a place of power because it's in the wilderness where you encounter the God Almighty. It is in the wilderness where he reveals himself to you. And it is in the wilderness where there's this stripping. It's in the wilderness where our vision that was clouded, now we can see. You see, sight is what we see with our eyes open. But vision is what we see with our eyes closed. And vision is given in the wilderness. It's like the analogy, anyone ever played Where's Waldo? Yeah? Anyone been extremely frustrated with that game? Okay? I remember being a kid in the doctor's office trying to find Waldo, and I'd be like, there he is. No, that's just another random character with the same striped hat. Why would they do that? You see, what happens when we do not have time to retreat into the wilderness is that there are a lot of things that look like God, but they're, they're not God. And so when God takes us to the wilderness, what he does is he begins stripping away all of the lookalikes, all of the crowdedness, all of the clouded vision. And instead he says, I am here, right here, and I want to reveal myself to you. What God does in the wilderness is that he gives us power. He reveals himself to us. Where the world can often cloud our vision, wilderness clears that same vision. And we have a practical story together of how we have witnessed how you, your vision can be clouded when there's too much. There's too much on your mind, right? That, that is why we go 
to the wilderness, even though it seems like a place we don't we don't want to be, right? But it's in that place where all distractions are cast aside. I remember coming home from work. I was working at the gym at this time, and I knew that I didn't feel well. I tried to fight it, right? I tried to act like I'm fine, but I knew I could feel my immune system was just going down, right? Minute by minute by minute. And I remember coming home, and this is when everyone was talking about, oh man, like COVID's on the rise again and different things like that. I was like, man, I pray I do not have COVID because I'm gonna miss work and I need to make money, right? That was, that was really my first thing. I, I didn't necessarily care whether or not I had COVID, but I said, because if I had COVID, that would mean I, I couldn't make money, right? I couldn't work. So I had a lot on my mind. I had already been trying to get as many hours as possible in training. And I remember coming home and that was the only thing on my mind. Oh man, God, please. I pray that I don't have COVID because if I do, I'm gonna miss so many days of work. I'm praying. I remember telling Vanessa, I said, I think, you know, I think I may have COVID. I hope I don't, but I need to take a test when I get home. What did you, what did you do after that? Well, he must've been really surprised as to how happy I was for him to take a test. Cause I was just like, really, you need to take a test? Yeah, I have a test for you. Don't worry, I have a test. See, what he didn't know is that I had just taken a pregnancy test. Okay? And I was thinking about how to tell him. I was praying about it. I was like, God, how am I going to tell him? It's our first child. I really want to tell him in a great way. And he comes home. I got to take a test. And I said, the Lord delivers and answers prayers. I was like, I know exactly what kind of test he's going to say. So I was like, babe, don't worry. Take the swab. I'll take care of it. Close the door. Set up the camera in like a perfect spot. And then I was like, okay, your results are ready. I have the COVID test on top. And the pregnancy test, really big, right at the bottom. I was like, I, he can't miss this. Like, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be right there. Camera set up. Babe, come on in. He's like sweating bullets coming in. Oh, my gosh. What's that? And he looks at the test. And then he looks at me. And he looks at the test. And he looks at me. He goes, Vanessa, why does it, why does it say pregnant? <laughs> Is it supposed to say positive or negative? It's on camera. If you want to know, I have it. I have it. This is, a, this is a true story. We are not over exaggerating. In my mind, I was not thinking that she was pregnant. All I was thinking about was COVID. So I'm pregnant? Wait a second. I was staring there for at least like two minutes. Yes. Right? I was just looking down. And I was like, what kind of COVID test is this? <laughs> It doesn't even say if I'm positive or negative. It says pregnant. I don't understand. So I turn around like she said and I asked her like, why does it say pregnant? And then I thought in my mind, oh, oh, wait a minute. And she's like jumping up and down behind me. And I had to kind of like reframe my thoughts like, oh, this is actually a happy moment. Right? That was not on my mind. And I was positive for COVID. <laughs> so I was obviously torn in that moment. Um, but I remember being super happy once I realized what was going on. But that just shows you how much a clouded mind can cloud your vision. It just shows you. A clouded mind will always cloud our vision. And this is why we have to have those wilderness seasons. This is why we leave the wilderness stronger than we enter. Because we leave with a clarity that we didn't have before. We leave with the revelation of God telling us that he has plans for us that exceed just our life. right? But the plans that he has for us are going to change generations. But it's in the wilderness that we can actually get to that place and understand, right? But this, this isn't fun. Right? There, there are times when the wilderness season is really hard. It's a struggle. But we have to remember that the wilderness is a privilege, not a punishment. The wilderness is a privilege, not a punishment. God is not putting us there 
because we've messed up. God's not putting us there because he's ashamed of us. But instead, like that wilderness season is preparation. Right? It's a privilege because where God is calling us next, we need to learn something in the wilderness to be able to apply that in the next season. We see the literal son of God, Jesus, goes into the wilderness before his public ministry. Why would Jesus have to go there? Right? He's already perfect. It's because the wilderness is a privilege. It's not a punishment. And we have to understand that as we continue this journey with God and finding out the three things that he wants. Mm -hmm. So we see in the life of John that in the wilderness, God reveals himself to him. So God wants to reveal himself, his will, and his plan to you, through you. And it is often in the wilderness that that happens. We also see in the life of John that God wishes to redeem us, to redeem parts of our life, to redeem areas and to redeem people around us. We see this continuing in Luke chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. It says, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, you see the Bible fulfilling the prophecy here. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. We see that the Spirit of God fills John and fills Jesus to come and to redeem the low places the places in the valley, the people who are on top to be made low, the people who are low to be placed on top, for God to come and take the kingdom and to turn it on its head to the point where even to the end, the disciples don't understand what is this happening? Aren't you supposed to come in and conquer? He says, yeah, I'm going to conquer, but with my blood, not with the blood of others, because I want to come and redeem them. I want to come into this place and I want to make the gospel accessible. I love this, that he will come and the crooked shall become straight. You see, what happens oftentimes in our life is that we can complicate the gospel. We can make what's supposed to be straight a little windy and a little crooked. Yeah, so like following God, it's easy. Uh, You just say, yes, I accept you into my heart. But then you have to do this perfectly. And then, oh, don't even think about watching that. And oh, watch him. You got to duck over here and, and maybe take a turn around there. What the Bible is telling me is that it's very simple. The areas that are crooked are now made straight. And all shall receive the salvation of God. Shall they accept it? I feel like the gospel can get so complicated the older we get, but when we're little, don't they often teach us a simple verse? I'll start it. For God, that he, that whoever shall not but have, that's it, folks. The gospel is simple. So let's not complicate it. For God wants to come and he desires to redeem us. And that redemption is not complicated for us, complicated for him. (laughs) He's the one that had to leave and and come and and incarnate a human body and, and live perfectly and die a horrible death and resurrect. I mean, complicated for God, but simple for us because God desires to redeem us. And now we can live in the confidence that we have been redeemed by his blood. I want you to follow me to verse 8. So we're in, or again, we're in Luke chapter 3, verse 8. Luke chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. What does that mean? It's a lot of words, right? Bigger words. There are a lot of things in the Bible that we may read, and then we'll just keep reading until we find out something that we actually understand. <laughs> but here it's bear fruits in keeping with repentance. What what does that actually look like? What it means for us is our life and our actions reflect the belief that we've been redeemed. That we've been forgiven. So when we live life knowing 
that we have been forgiven and we will continue to be forgiven every single time we ask for forgiveness because we are sinful and we make mistakes. Living life with that understanding, it becomes really hard to judge others when you know how much you need to be forgiven. Right? When, when you realize what God brought you out of, living with that in mind, it's very hard for us to look at others and feel like we are in a superior position. Because we understand, we have this humility and understanding that says, I can imagine where I would be if it were not for God. If it were not for his grace, if it were not for his forgiveness. But what tends to happen is we forget. We forget where God brought us from. And, and we don't do what the text is saying and bear fruit, right? And bearing fruit, keeping with repentance. Instead, we think that we'll bear fruit from what we earn. We're going we're gonna to bear fruit from our achievements, from what we do well. And we forget how often we have to repent because we are sinful creatures. We are far from perfect. It becomes harder to make enemies with people when you view life with that lens. I made a mistake. I said something that could have been taken offensively, right? And then this person just said something that offended me. But I know that I've been in that position before. So shouldn't I treat them with the same grace that I would want if I made a mistake in something that I said? Right? But that mindset is really hard. And this is why we end up having enemies or people that we feel like we're better than. You know, we're, we're a little bit more superior than that person. I remember I had an enemy in high school. Right. I had an enemy in high school. I was in a relationship um, with this girl who was not who was not Vanessa, by the way. So what I'm about to say, just know those attributes do not belong to Vanessa. Um, just so you know. And this girl, um, she she enjoyed seeing me get uh, jealous or have reactions and different things like that. So there was this guy that she was in a relationship before me. And we had the same birthday. So already I said, man, like, I can't even have my own birthday, right? <laughs> like, dude, how, how does this happen? So I remember she would bring this up all the time. And she would bring up the different things that we had in common. And I found myself, the more I would hear about him, the more I would just think to myself, like, man, like, why does he want to be me so bad, right? The dude was 6'2", so I don't think he wanted to be me, right? I'm 5'5", five five, so I don't think that was really something that he, he really cared for. But I just remember the more things that she would tell me, I would just, I would just grow and grow and grow in my resentment for this person, right? We would, we would have to see each other at certain like youth events because even though we went to different schools, the Adventist Church tries to have a lot of different conferences where schools can come together and meet. So I remember being with him in these conferences, and sometimes we would even be in the restroom at the same time, right? Like washing our hands, just looking straight in the mirror because we didn't want to look side to side because we knew each other were there. Right? I'm sure she was telling him the same stuff she was telling me. And I remember just, I never wanted to be in his presence. And then I stopped being in a relationship with this girl. I met Vanessa. We started dating. We went to Southern. I found out this guy was super close friends with Vanessa. Right? How do you think I felt about that? And that was, I, I didn't see it coming. I'm not going to lie. Caught me off guard a little bit. But I said that I would be calm. You know, I'd take a deep breath. And I remember having to hang out with him for the first time. It was so awkward. So awkward, like, hey man, hey, how are you? Cool. I like your shoes. Oh, thanks, man. Right? Just, just a little awkward. The more time I spent with this dude, the 
the closer we became in our friendship. We got to a point in college where we were always in each other's rooms. People thought we were roommates because he was always in my room. And I look back in that experience, and how did I go from being someone's enemy to becoming such close friends with him in less than a year? When I think about it, God redeemed the relationship. And God was able to redeem the relationship because we both came to a place where we were willing to put aside our differences and find common ground. And that can happen for every single one of us. Every single one of us. But we have to be willing to do so. I remember having conversations with him, apologizing for how I treated him in the past. And he had the same conversations with me. But that's what living a redeemed life looks like. Right? God is able to redeem some of the things that you would have never seen coming in the future. But that's what happens when we place our lives in God's hands. Because when we live a redeemed life, we realize that it's not us versus them. It's us and Him. There's no divide here because God comes into these low places, these dark places, the, the places that we try to set aside, and He desires to redeem those places. He just desires for us to be humble, to admit when we have done wrong, to put it at his feet and to say, I want to make a path for the Messiah to come and to come into all these places and to, for all people to see his salvation. So we see that God desires and what he wants for us is to reveal himself, his plan, his will in our life. He desires to redeem us and those around us. And lastly, he desires to release us. To release us. Let's continue in, John, in Luke chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. John is preaching this message. People are getting baptized. He's rebuking people left and right. And so people start talking, as people often do when exciting things happen. And as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You see, the, whole, the people there are talking amongst themselves. And the Bible says that they're saying these things in their hearts. So I also wonder, maybe if John didn't necessarily overhear, but if the Holy Spirit revealed to him to say, hey, these people are thinking these things. And because John is a wingman, right, because he knows it's not about him, he goes and he takes the, the, the first step to say, hey, this is, I, you're not the, the one you're thinking about is not me. I'm not the one you're looking for. I'm not the one who can save you. I'm not, I can only do this part, what I'm called to do. And me being, a, although I am a prophet and Jesus is one of the greatest prophets, right? He lowers himself and he is released from the responsibility of having to be the Christ. How many times do we step into situations wanting to be the savior, but there's only one of those? How many times do we pine after positions where we're, we're trying to make a way because we want something, we see it, we're like, I want this for myself, I really want to be here, I want to get this promotion, I want to have this level of authority, and we're trying to move away, but there's only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's the one who promotes and demotes us. He's the one that places kings and removes them, no? And so what I see in the life of John is that God wants to release us from responsibility that we try to put on our shoulders, but really the weight is too heavy for us to bear. As John is hearing these things, he says, man, you're not the one, I'm not the one you're looking for. It reminds me of conversations that Jamil will often have with me. He'll be like, yeah, I was talking to so-and-so and they're like, Jamil, I'd love to hang out with you and your wife. Tell me when you're free, what does your calendar look like? And he said, no, no. No, uh, no, uh, uh. Um, you, do you have my wife's number? She's the calendar. She's the planner. So anything having to do with that, or people will come to me like Vanessa, you look great. Like, what are you doing? Do you have a gym routine? No, 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 no. I'm not. This he he's the one who can help you with the anything with the gym. He's the one. Right? We we know our roles. We know our limitations. 
what we can and can't do, what we are called and not called to do. And so when we see the life of John, we see that it's clear that his call is to make a way for God. His, his call is to be a prophet to all those, to, to baptize them in the name of Jesus, for, to call for repentance. And God calls you to a specific role, but don't confuse what God has called you to do for only things that he can do in your life. So God releases us from the responsibility of having to be God, of having to know all things, see all things coming, to have uh, every, every answer to every problem, to every solution, to always being the mender and the peacemaker for everyone in our family. Instead, he says, give it to me. Let me do it. This is my job. I release you from that responsibility. Something I really appreciate about John the Baptist and why he is second to Jesus, um, but my favorite character in the Bible John the Baptist is my favorite character in the Bible because something I really appreciate about him is that he humbled himself, right? He humbled himself on a daily basis. And I've learned the closer I get to God, I would rather humble myself than be humbled by him. I would rather humble myself than be humbled by him. You see in John 3.30, it says, he must increase, but I must decrease. These are, these are words from John the Baptist. He must increase, but I must decrease. There's, there's this understanding that John the Baptist has that just says, man, like, I am okay being in the background. As long as you see Jesus, I'm good. He had no secret agenda that he was trying to push he was just trying to make sure that people saw Jesus. That was it. He humbled himself. And I know that in our lives, there are going to be a lot of opportunities that, that God gives us, right? And, and people trying to crown us as the Messiah, like they were trying to do to John the Baptist, where we have the opportunity to either humble ourselves or be humble. My encouragement to you guys is to humble yourself. Because when you're humbled by God, it is, it is a completely different feeling than when, than when you humble yourselves. Right? I remember my first Sabbath, um, we have a church service at GMA before the school year starts. I remember it was my first Sabbath there. And as some of you may know, um, I hate being late. Um, I'm actually allergic to being late. I break out in leprosy if I'm, if I'm late. It's that big of a deal. Um, and I know that for me, for me, it is very important to not just be on time, right? Being on time for me is not the goal because if I'm on time and there's a car accident, then I'm late, right? I need to be early so that if there's a car accident, then I'm on time. That's kind of how I think. I rarely will ever show up to a place less than 30 minutes before I need to be there. Rarely ever. I'm just um, like that too. <laughs> I'm just gonna smile to that comment. But I, I, it really bothered me. So I remember I got to the school early and the gate was closed. So I'm thinking to myself, man, am I really gonna have to wait outside the gate until someone comes? I like being early, but I don't want to wait because Vanessa had to drop me off. It's like, I don't want to wait in the sun in clothes that I'm going to preach in for 30 or 40 something minutes before they come to open up the gate. And I remembered that Lorna, the principal, she gave me a key. I thought to myself, I wonder if this key opens up anything else other than my office. So I said, the, the least I could do is try, right? So I went to the gate. And I wanted to see if it could unlock the gate. I put the key in and I unlocked it. Immediately. This power came over me. Right? And I felt unstoppable in that moment. To give you context, in my last job, I was always the first one at the gym. And I never had a master key. I took that personally. Because right? I felt like I'm always here first. And I still have to wait on people to come. Like, just give me a key already. 
Like, I've, I've earned it, right? But my first day on the job at GMA, I have a master key. Right? There's a different level of confidence that you have when you have a master key. Right? So I, I opened up the gate, and I remember just walking, and like, I, went, I, did, I walked to the gate like this, right? But after I opened it, I was... <laughs> right? Like, I, I just had this, this confidence come over me, and I knew that I was in control. And I remember walking to the school and saying, man, like, will this open up the front door to the school as well? Tried the key. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the front door as well. I open the front door of the school. I'm about to close the door. Again, just, I'm really feeling myself in this moment. I'm about to close the door. I shut it. I turn to go to the gym. All of a sudden, and I'm looking around, I'm like, oh my word. I set the alarm to the entire school, and my instincts kicked in, and I just, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm ready. I'm like, black man just broke into private school on a Saturday. It is over. Like, I already know. I already know what's going to happen. I'm preparing myself, like, Vanessa, I love you. He She's pregnant me. at the time, he so I hadn't even met his mind yet. He called me on the phone in, in the background. Yeah. Rah, rah. Vanessa, yeah. I set off the alarm. Don't call me. Yes. I was saying goodbye, right? That's why I called her. And I remember in that moment, I don't know what to do. My key can't do anything about the alarm, right? I need a security code. In that moment, I was really thinking, I was panicking, and what came to mind was, okay, Maybe I should call Lorna, right? But I didn't want to, because in my mind, man, she, she gave me one thing to do. And I set off the entire alarm system to the school. On my first day, exactly. On my first day, the first assignment that you gave me, I messed it up. I don't want to call her because I was, I was a little ashamed. Right? I, I didn't want to ask for help. I was trying to figure it out on my own. But I don't know the code. I'm just going to be pressing buttons until the cops come. <laughs> and I had to swallow my pride and call Lorna. I called her. She gave me the security code immediately. I typed in the code. The alarm system stopped. I said, I'm sorry. Like, I know you're not here yet, but thank you so much. This is really helpful. I'll be in the gym waiting. Okay? Turn off the alarm. I thought to myself, well, that was embarrassing, right? But at least I have a good story, right? At least I got a good story out of that. But when I think about this, that's a testimony, right? And we all have that. And we have testimonies because we were in a place similar to the place that I found myself in, where even though we felt like we had the power, we felt like we had the control, we found ourselves in a position where we needed help. And unfortunately, there are many of us who are here right now who would rather go to prison than ask for help because of our pride. Because if we ask for help, then we have to admit that something's actually wrong or that we made a mistake. But it's in those moments when we have to call out to God. John the Baptist knew. He knew where his help came from. It wasn't his ability. It wasn't his talents. But it was God. And he was there so that people would see God. Right? And in that moment, there was only so much that my master key could do. Right? It, was, it was given to me. It opens some doors, but it doesn't solve every problem. God is going to give us certain things in life, right? Certain resources that we are able to use to bring glory to him. But if we allow for those resources to take over our devotion and our commitment to him, they will destroy us. And we have to stay humble. We have to stay in this place where we realize, God, 
Without you, I'm nothing. And we can't be afraid to call. I was ashamed to call on him. I didn't want to because I messed up. And Satan wants to keep you in that place. I don't know who you are right now in this room, but I know there's someone here. You're in need of help. And Satan is telling you that. You need to get yourself out. Because you got yourself into it. Don't call on God. He's just going to be ashamed that you found yourself in that place in the first place. But that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve, he's longing for us to call on him. He's longing for us to say, Dad, like I, I need help. I don't know how to get out of this situation, but I need help. I need you to come and fix this situation that I found myself in. And this is what John the Baptist understood. And for John the Baptist, I think for him, he really adopted this position of, I can set you up, right? I can set you up. These are the people that he was ministering to. I can set you up, but only God could set you free. I can set you up, but only God can set you free. As we are doing the call right now, I. I want you guys to understand that all we can do, all, all the pastoral staff can do, all the leaders in the church can do is just set people up. Can set you up to have an encounter with God. Right? We we can set you up to decide whether or not you wanna you wanna get baptized. We can't set you free though. We can't save you. There's only one savior. His name is not Jamil. It is Jesus. There's only one Savior. So at this time, I want to encourage you guys, if, if there was something that stuck out to you in the message, whether you are struggling because you're trying to see this revelation that God is trying to reveal to you in the wilderness, you find yourself in that wilderness season, if you need prayer, we want to ask you to We just want to ask you to stand. There's limited space right here. Um, to stand, we're going to pray for you. So if you were in that group where you find yourself in a wilderness season and you just want prayer, you want revelation, this calls for you. If you if you are in the second group where you are struggling, either asking for forgiveness or forgiving someone else who hurt you in the past, and you are still carrying that with you to this day then this prayer is for you. If you are struggling with forgiveness or unforgiveness, this prayer is for you. And lastly, the last group, we can't talk about John the Baptist without talking about baptism. If you find yourself in a place where you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you need to be released, you need to be freed, you realize that you are in chains. And no matter how hard you fight, it just seems like the chains just get tighter and tighter and tighter. And you want to be set free this morning in giving your life to Jesus. This call is for you. And this prayer is for you. Vanessa is going to close with prayer. But before she did that, I just wanted to say that I know... God needed someone to hear this message. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, I have a personal testimony, and I did not have a voice for two days this week. I lost my voice entirely. And I remember, as you guys know, I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm sprinting to get up here to preach a sermon, right? So I said, all right, God, maybe I don't have to speak. <laughs> Praise God, right? But I said... If I get my voice back at the end of the week, then I'll do the message of Vanessa. And literally, yesterday, I woke up and I had a voice. Part of me was excited and the other part was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Man. But I know someone here today 
you may think it's a coincidence. You maybe were going to go to another church and then you thought, oh, well, maybe this is closer. Might as well go to this one. But I'm here to tell you right now, it is not. God wanted to meet you here. God has planned this way in advance. So if you find yourself in these groups, if you want to talk about baptism afterwards, you can talk to Pastor Vanessa, you can talk to Brian, you can talk to Miguel, you can talk to me. But I pray that you will open up your hearts and your minds to where the Spirit is leading today. So let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful that you continually give us your spirit and that you teach us so intricately from your word what you desire and what you want in our life. Lord, I know that there are people here that are looking for a revelation. God, maybe it's a revelation of who you are. Perhaps they've had a skewed view of who you really are and what you really think of them. So God, I pray that you would come and you would take their clouded mind and make it clear. God, perhaps there are people here that have been banging down doors of the will that they want for their own life. They see issues and they want to solve them and they're trying hard and they've come to this place between a rock and a hard place, God. And it seems like no matter what they do and all of the effort that they put in, they just can't seem to find the answer. So God, I pray today in the name of Jesus that you would reveal yourself to them. Perhaps it is not the way that they are journeying that you want them to go. So I pray that you would help them make and shift directions, God. That you would reveal your will and your purpose for them. Lord, we also pray for those who are praying for redemption. Redemption of relationships. Redemptions of parts of their life that they have tried to hide away. That they think, no, this is too hard, too difficult, too dark. But God, you are the light in the darkness, and the darkness will not, cannot, will never extinguish it. And so God, we believe that you come and you will redeem even the messiest of situations, because where sin abounds, grace more so abounds. Lord, we also pray, lastly, for those who are seeking after you and your heart. And Lord, they look, and they look to their right and their left, and they see these chains that bind them. Lord, maybe it's chains of depression, of anxiety. Lord, chains of abuse, of addiction. God, whatever it may be, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would come and you would release it. That they would surrender their life to you holistically. Lord, we know that there are people that have yet to surrender themselves wholly to you. So we pray that if they would take this step forward as those on the banks of the river heard the cry of John, come forth and be baptized. And so, God, we pray for those who have made that decision. We're so grateful that you are doing a work and that even if today is not the day that they say yes, we know that they are one step closer to that water. Lord, we're grateful for the work that you're doing and will continue to do. We lay it on your hands and we love you, knowing that we could not love you as much as you love us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.